All right. Good morning and good afternoon. I say good morning because I'm in El Paso, Texas, so I'm an hour behind the rest of y'all. And good afternoon for those of you that are in Center Standard Time. My name is Bonnie Perez Ramirez, and I am the director for Partners Resource Network's Pen Project. And if you're not familiar with Partners Resource Network, um, it is the nonprofit agency that operates the Texas statewide network of parent training and information centers. And we serve families um, of children and youth with disabilities ages 0 to 26. And we also work with youth self-advocates ages 14 to 26. The PTIs are funded through the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, and here in Texas, we actually have four PTIs. And the Penn Project serves families in ESC regions 9, 12, and 14 through 19. So that's about 122 counties here in Texas. Our mission is to empower and support Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. We can help you understand your child's disability, understand your rights and responsibilities under IDEA, obtain and evaluate resources and services for your individual. And we help you understand how to fully participate as a team member with the professionals in planning all of the services for your student. And today um, we have an amazing session. I was able to go through the PowerPoint a little bit before we got started. And so I hope you find it really, really helpful. And I'll let um, Ms. Allison take over from here. Thanks so much, Bonnie. It's always a pleasure to be back with you today. Yeah, this is one of those topics when we start talking about government benefits. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of confusion. And if you have felt confused or overwhelmed by, um, by you know, topics surrounding SSI and Medicaid, SSDI and Medicare, I, the first thing I want to tell you is you are absolutely not alone and you're not crazy. It is confusing. And so today, uh, we're going to be talking about government benefits 101, and we're going to going to we're going to get in the weeds uh, a little bit on these things. Um, I'm Allison Scobber, Consolidated Planning Group. Um, I own a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We do webinars um, and podcasts all the time surrounding topics uh, regarding planning for special needs and you know key things that you need to know. Um, all of our um, past uh, webinars do live on our YouTube channel, the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, um, and we also have podcasts uh, as well. So um, anybody that's joining from a podcast and they want a copy of the slides, you can email us at contact at cpgcares.net. Everybody that's uh, participating today, um, they are going to get a copy of the recording and a copy of the today's slides. So you don't have to take notes of every single thing uh, I say because you are going to get those slides. Um, so, um, you know, at, at Consolidated Planning Group, we've we've been around for um, over 30 years. Again, we're a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We are an advisory uh, and consulting firm, and we help families just like yours plan for the future. We we talk about things about having, um, you know, maybe money in the right buckets. Families come to us and they say, hey, we want to plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, but how, how much do we need to fund a special needs trust for my, my loved one? Where can we have money that won't count against um, my loved one for, you know, state and federally funded programs? So we really um, get in the weeds with, with families on all of those topics so that way we can maximize those benefits for your loved one um, for not just now, but for their life and, and for their future, um, a future that will um, may include a time when you're no longer here. So it, planning, planning early, planning intentional is really, really important on that. So today, talking about government benefits. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things that we're going to talk about. You may have some questions. You can put your questions in the chat box today. Um, we can't see you or hear you, in case you were wondering. Um, so um, any background noise, we're not hearing any of that. Um, Bonnie's going to monitor the chat box today, and we're going to answer just as many questions as as we can. So. When we're getting started talking about government benefits, I think it's very, very important for us to understand the differences of the different programs, okay? SSDI versus SSI, they are two very, very different programs. So let's start 
by talking about social security disability, also called SSDI, also called social security. It is not called SSI, okay? So SSDI is confusing in itself when we start talking about the confusion that some of us have, because it would only make sense that if my child has a disability that they might qualify for social security disability. It doesn't really work like that. So I wanna dispel some of those myths out there. Social security disability, um, it, the, the payment is coming from the disability trust fund, okay? Uh, it's an insurance that workers earn by paying social security taxes on their, on their wages. So when we're working, we're paying into the system. You may have seen your social security statement before. Um, we talk about quarters, work quarters, 40 quarters is, is, is a fully insured individual, which 40 quarters equates to 10 years of working experience. Those quarters and what is necessary for our loved one with a disability is less the younger that the person is as the person gets older, those quarters ne necessary are more. It's never more than 40, but like for a younger person, it might be eight or 10 depending on their age, okay? So benefits to the disabled individuals who are unable to work regardless of, of their, their, their income and resources, okay? So, so uh, social security disability is income for a person who is disabled, who has paid into the system, okay? So benefits, it's benefits for workers and adults disabled since childhood, but you must meet insured status requirements. So. A lot of times what happens is a family, they have uh, an adult with a disability and they apply for SSI. When you apply for SSI, we're gonna talk more about SSI in a moment, you also apply for SSDI, two separate different programs, right? Because it's all coming from the Social Security Administration, the letters that come, although it does say Social Security Disability or Social Security versus SSI on the letter, the font is the same, the print is the same, and then you can easily confuse those letters. So I've really had families call me very, very upset because they got a letter of denial from the Social Security Administration denying um, disability benefits for their disabled adult child and the parents are very frustrated. They can't believe, I mean, that the child is clearly disabled and how could anybody in their right mind say that they don't qualify for disability? So when you start your application, you apply for benefits. They don't always tell you that you're applying for both. They don't always tell you that you're going to get two separate letters, one from supplemental security income and one from social security disability income. Typically, the social security disability income letter comes first. That letter of denial comes first. And that's one that you should be expecting. You should be ex expecting that letter of denial from, from the social security administration. If your child has never worked, they've never paid in the social security disability system, this is through the Disability Trust Fund. They've never paid into the trust fund and they are being denied. It's not necessarily saying that the child isn't disabled. They're just saying that they don't have any work credits and they don't qualify for Social Security Disability, which is the reason why it's denied. What that letter does not tell you is that soon, depending on what your idea of soon is, it could be a couple of weeks to a couple of months, you're going to get a letter from SSI letting you know if they've been approved or denied for SSI. Okay, so first things first, I want you to know about the two letters because a lot of people are very, very upset about that first letter. So the first letter is probably deserved and it's, there's nothing wrong and they're still processing that SSI application. SSI is supplemental security income. So it's so very important that you understand the difference between the two programs. Um, payments come from the general tax revenues, not the SSA trust funds, okay? It's a need, needs-based public assistance program that does not require a person to have a work history. Um, it is based off of considered a, a person that is disabled and indigent, okay? And we're going to talk about what those terms mean in just a moment. This is going to pay a disabled individual who's unable to work or has a limited working ability, and they have limited income and resources. Um, benefits for children and adults in financial needs, they must have limited income, limited resources, 
And one thing that is important for families to know when we're thinking about SSI, if your child is under the age of 18, when they're looking at those income and resource limits, they're looking at the parents' income and resources when the child is under age 18. So some people have applied before, their child's clearly disabled, but they were denied because they simply had too much assets or too much income and the child was denied. But what not everybody knows is that everything changes when the child turns 18. So when the child turns 18, those income and assets are based off of the child's income and assets, not the parents. And this is true even if you have guardianship of, of your loved one. This is true even if your um, loved one lives in your household, even if you claim them on the tax return. Those are all some questions that come up with, um, with people. But when they turn 18, that's that magic age where those um, income and resources change and they start looking at the child's, not, not yours. So... How we um, so when we're kind of looking at some of some of the assets and, and income resources and what we're looking at here, SSI and Medicaid come together. So SSI um, is right now it's 914 per month is what comes in. Um, but to qualify for SSI, you have to be disabled and you have to be indigent. So if a child is 18 they're not married, they can have no more than $2,000 assets in, the, in their name. The SSI requirements are the same requirements that are required for Medicaid eligibility as well. Now, there are over 109 Medicaid programs in the state of Texas, just so you know, there's a lot of them. So yes, Medicaid comes with SSI and that's part of that program, but there are various Medicaid programs where um, the assets are uh, based on the child, not the parent, even when they're under age 18, like in some of the specific waivers in the state of Texas and things like that. So um, it's not always based off of the parent's asset if the child is a minor when it comes to Medicaid, but it always is when it comes to SSI. So if we're, we have kids um, that are under age 18, mar married couples can have 3,000 in assets. If there's a child and one parent, 4,000 in assets, a child and uh, two parents, uh, $5,000. So where I'm saying married couples, I'm saying a married couple, and we're not talking about a child with a disability, but one of the parents has a disability. That's where that $3,000 comes in. And so it just depends on, on what your status is, on what that number is, and what it looks like. So one of the questions that comes up all the time is, can I have a house and can I have a car? And so the answer is yes. In all cases, an individual with a disability could have one house and one car, which is not a countable asset, okay? Um, there are some provisions for more than one car if the car is very, very old or if there's a large loan on the car or if a person um, is planning on selling that car to use the, the, the uh, proceeds from the sale of that car to pay for final expenses. Those are some examples where it wouldn't, um, they wouldn't count those two cars. Um, when it comes to a house, it's truly the house. So if we have a house and land, that's two separate things, then they would count that land. Um, so if the house is on the land and it's all together and on one deed, that's fine. But if we had a house that was on one deed and then we have 40 acres that's on another deed, then that's a whole whole nother ballgame. So I want to be clear on, on the assets. Um, Bonnie, how are we um, on questions? Okay, we have our first one says, could you advise on preserving SSI benefits when my disabled son works part-time and which limits should I be mindful of? Yes, we are going to talk about that. And so um, let's see if, if, if we answer those questions in the presentation. Um, anything else? Yes. How do they expect disabled persons to ever get on SSDI if they can't work? And then okay, there's that's a personal a great example. Question. Yeah. Okay. So that is a great question. And so um, the, the thing is, is um, there is a magic age of 22 uh, with the Social Security Administration. So if an individual um, is considered disabled prior to the age of 22, uh, that your child with a disability whose disability began prior to age 22, they have the ability to be covered under a parent's work record. 
And that is now called childhood disability benefits. We're going to talk a little bit more about that because that is exactly how they qualify for Social Security disability. It's under a parent's record. Now, if so some people ask, oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Um, and my child is 25 now. Can I still get that? And the answer is yes. It's not that you had to apply for it prior to the child turning 22. It is um, that the child's disability, you have to have evidence that shows that the child's disability began prior to age 22. So we're going to get in the weeds with that for sure. So when we're talking about SSDI, RSDI, so SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, RSDI, Retirement Survivors Disability Income, those are all terms that they throw around with the Social Security Disability. And, and it's no wonder everybody's confused when we have all these little acronyms that they're throwing around and they all sound the same, but they're very different programs. So again, um, SSDI, RSDI, um, comes along after 24 months um, of, with Medicare. So if a person qualifies for Social Security disability under their own work record, after 24 months, they're going to be eligible for Medicare. Um, and if they qualify for basically retirement survivors disability income under a parent's record, again, after 24 months, uh, they're going to be eligible for Medicare. And a lot of times they'll call them concurrent enrollees or um, dual beneficiaries where they qualify for Medicaid and Medicare. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so, so disability rules for an adult over age 18, SSDI and SSI. So physical and or mental impairment, the disability is expected to last 12 consecutive months or result in death. Um, there's consideration for the age, the education, the past work experience, but the key that you got to know is the inability to perform substantial work activity, and they also refer to substantial work activity as SGA, substantial gainful amount, okay? So these are all things that they're going to be looking at. So right now, um, the substantial gainful activity, so this is basically in the eyes of the Social Security Administration, they basically say that when you're applying for SSI, if the individual is earning at the time of the application um, 1470 gross earnings per month uh, or more, then basically they're saying that the individual isn't disabled, that they are earning more than the substantial gainful amount, and they will deny their application for SSI. So one of the things that you, that you need to know is some of the questions that I get is, well, if my child has a part-time job, so we've got a lot of kids that are in the workforce, VR, or like summer earn and learn, or uh, pre -ets or something like that, where they're working, maybe they're working eight hours a week. It's not very much, right? Um, you can still apply for, for, for SSI as long as their um, earnings are less than that substantial gainful amount of $1,470 gross earnings per month. This amount changes every year. I just put the 22, 22 amount on there just because that's what it was last year at $1,350 per month. If the individual is blind, the substantial gainful am uh, amount is $2,460 for 2023. Um, SSI only uses the substantial gainful amount as a measure of work during the initial claims. So again, if the child is working, they're making more than 1470 gross per month, the application is going to be de denied right off the bat, regardless of what their diagnoses are or their disabilities are. SSDI, Social Security Disability, is going to use the substantial gainful amount throughout the life of the claim, okay? So when we're looking at, you know, those two different programs, those are things to keep in mind. And then the other thing, you know, I mentioned that this SGA changes every year. So next year, you know, you, you kind of see the trajectory. It was 1350. It was like 12 something, you know, in 2021, it goes up. So this, 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 this moves, this, this number moves. And so if your child, for instance, is is 17 and they're not turning 18 till 2024, you're going to want to be aware of what that substantial gainful amount is um, for 2024. So a couple of things here. I mean, there's, you know, there's different mindsets here. Um, we've got families that are hopeful and optimistic that their child will work. They're working on working. They're in transition programs. They're in vocational rehab, trying to close the gaps 
on their impediments to employment. And the hope uh, is that they will be able to work in the future and will have the you know substantial gainful activity. And and then I hear from families that are like holding their child back that has the ability to to work and have some substantial gainful activity because they're afraid that they're going to lose SSI or SSI and and Medicaid. And so my mindset on that now everybody's situation is a little bit different and some people truly truly need the Medicaid their their child has critical services you know maybe the child's on a ventilator there's big things going on big expenses and Medicaid has saved their life okay so I understand that thought process and we have to look at those things very very carefully but ultimately what I would say is our mission and our goal is we we want the kids to be as, you know, as functional as they can. And if they can have, you know, earn more than the substantial gainful amount, great. That's what we want. That's what we've been working for for 18 years. We, we want to move them that in that direction. So SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is only 914 a month. So nobody is, you know, making a killing off of SSI. It's not, a, you know, a, a lucrative level of existence. So if they can earn more, I'm a fan of them earning more and moving away from that. As they're working under their own record, they're building Social Security credits for Social Security disability in the future. Um, so that way, if something happens later and they can't work, they will be able to draw off of their own records. So those are things to keep in mind. Okay, so we kind of talked about this effective January 2023. We saw a big increase um, for an individual for SSI, and so that is 914 per month. I like to pause here, and I like to say that if your check that you're receiving is less than 914 a month and your child is not working, the reason your um, check is less than 914 uh, a month is because SSI is designed to pay for food and shelter. It tells me that you have not submitted a rent agreement showing that your child is paying rent um, to get the full amount. So if you have not submitted a rent agreement saying that your child is paying rent, uh, 500 is commonly an uh, amount charged, um, then there's going to be a one-third reduction to the SSI. So if you're getting a 600 and some change number, uh, that tells me that you probably need to submit the, the, the rent agreement. If your child is working, there are deductions for work, and we're going to talk more about that. So if a couple, um, a married couple, both parties are disabled, then that amount is $1,371 per month. Okay? So getting started. So when you're thinking about applying for SSI or if you already have what the Social Security Administration is looking at to determine whether or not your loved one um, is disabled or not is the Social Security Blue Book, okay? This is basically a medical impairment guide that they use, and they list conditions by the name. And, um, and in that Blue Book, this link here, it's going to tell you exactly what they're looking for to prove that the individual is disabled, okay? Um, this is a book, if you're thinking about um, applying, that I would look up all of your loved one's diagnoses, whatever they may be. We see comorbid conditions. We see Down syndrome with autism. We see, I mean, there's so many different things. We see autism with an alphabet soup of mental health diagnoses and things like that. So you want to look all of them up because one of the ones that you think might be a slam dunk may not be what causes them to be considered disabled, but one that you thought you almost forgot might be what is what is going to be the deciding factor and, and then be being considered disabled. There is a good booklet out there on understanding SSI. Um, I always joke and say it's not a light read or if you ever can't sleep at night, there you have it. But, um, but there is a lot of good information in that booklet and there's a link for that as well. Okay, um, Bonnie, let's take a couple of questions right now. Okay. So the first one is, do you have to prove this um, disability every year to keep SSI? It's not every year. It's at their discretion. So there are some disabilities um, in the eyes of the Social Security Administration that are considered a permanent disability. They're never going to change. They're never going to get better. And they're considered a, a permanent disability. And if your loved one is marked that way, typically, um, 
they only review um, every seven years. However, I have a child marked that way and they reviewed in three years. So anyway, what can I say? So, so they are going to review um, from time to time to ensure that the individual is still um, disabled. They are also going to do a financial review from time to time. Um, there's a lot of families um, out there that ask, should I have a separate account for my child's SSI? I highly recommend that um, to where the SSI would be, de um, you know, direct deposited to because whenever it's time for the financial review, then you're going to send the account statements for that account. If you have it commingled in your account, it's messy, it's not clean, and I definitely don't recommend that. You can do whatever you want, but that's not something that I would recommend. Hey, next question is, can I buy a house for my disabled adult child? Yes, you can. And they can have one house and, and one car, right? So they, they definitely can have one house and one car. Some people buy a house and they keep it in the confines of a special needs trust. The kid could have the house outright in their own name. Um, so you, you definitely can do that. Okay, great. Is room and board issued by the guardianship judge the same as rent? Um, the rent agreement is just, it's just basically just a, a rent agreement. It's a one pager. We have a template for that. And it's just basically saying that you're charging your loved one rent and this is the amount and, and I'm charging the same amount of, um, rent that I would charge any border. This includes food and shelter is basically, um, what that is. It's just a one pager. So, I mean, if you already have a room and board agreement or if there's something already in place, you can use that. Um, we have a lot of families that have kids with disabilities that actually do have a rental property or like where they're, um, you know, they're paying rent, they have a lease, they might be in an apartment or something like that. And so that can be used as well. And then we have someone requesting the Blue Book link, and I can go ahead and add that um, myself. And then we have Ms. Skaberg, if I submit my son's rent agreement to the Social Security office, can they give us back pay? They don't usually do back pay, but they'll do it going forward. Um, they, they're not, the only time that we're going to see um, back pay is from the date of your application for SSI. Um, the Social Security Administration, they're understaffed, they're overworked, they're behind. Um, the process, um, the process for these applications are, it's long, it could take three to six months. There are some things, and we'll talk about presumptive conditions. Um, but so they'll do a, a, a backdate on that application, but I haven't seen them do a backdate on the rent agreement. And do you have to meet income criteria if diagnosis is under the compassionate allowance list? Yes, you still. So the compassionate allowance, we are going to talk about that in just a moment, but the compassionate allowance or um, presumptive disabilities. So there's a long list. There's like over 200 diagnoses that are on a compassionate allowance. Things that come to mind are um, cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome. Those are things that come to mind. There's a lot of them on there. Um, it basically means that the Social Security um, Administration is going to presume an individual that has that diagnosis is disabled. Okay, so um, they will fast track the um, the application. They will actually start payments before the application is actually even approved because if they're on the compassionate allowance or the presumptive list. Okay. Um, all right. So when do you apply and what should you apply for? So we suggest applying for SSI the month of your child's 18th birthday if you you know, fall, we don't have many that fall into the category of the income and low income and then and, 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 and guidelines of assets. A lot of families aren't, you know, their, their child's not going to qualify prior to age 18. If you do, by all means apply. Um, but again, what we would say is, again, it's 914 a month. So if a parent has the capacity to earn more than 9, 914 uh, you know, per month and can have group benefits through the employer and things like that, you're certainly going to be better off going down that uh, direction. So assuming the child turns 18, um, there's a couple of different ways that you can go about doing this. Um, and I want to be clear, um, if you're wanting to schedule an in-person appointment, we, we suggest that you call a few months in advance to schedule it 
for after they turn 18. Most of the Social Security Administration offices are backed up. So if you call today, you're not getting an appointment this month. It's going to be a few months before you're going to even get a face-to-face -face appointment. So if you're wanting to meet face-to-face, -face, call a few months in advance, but make absolutely sure that the appointment is not until after their 18th birthday, because if it's before, it's going to be based off of the parents' income and assets. I can't stress this enough. Enough. It is an absolute waste of time to go uh, if your assets are over the limit prior to age 18. Okay. The second option is apply for SSI online, and I like this option the best. Okay. Um, they launched this in April of 2022, where you could apply for SSI online, and it's going to save the date of the application. And if approved, the benefits will be backdated to that date. Okay, so this literally takes like five minutes to do. Um, and basically, it says, thank you for your interest in applying. And someone will get back to you in a couple of weeks and schedule your appointment to take the application. Okay, then usually what happens is they're going to call you in a couple of weeks. They're going to set your application, which could be over the phone, which they're, they're favoring over the phone applications. Or if you really wanted to go in person, then you could go uh, in person. And so they'll set that up. So um, so one of the things that you want to you, you get ready for your appointments. And a lot of times people feel nervous about this meeting. Okay, so don't be nervous. Knowledge is power. Get your, get your ducks in a row. I suggest creating a folder on your computer, uh, you know, an SSI folder, and just you know, getting your stuff in that folder so that way you're ready for the appointment, whether it's by phone or whether it's in person, you have this information together. You want to have evidence that demonstrates that your child's disability began prior to age 22, if it did, to be able to qualify for childhood disability benefits, which is now referred to commonly as CDB. So we love acronyms, they throw them around. CDB is Childhood Disability Benefits. The interesting thing is the Social Security Administration called CDB uh, Disabled Adult Child or DAC. They used that term for like 40 years and then randomly two years ago they changed the name to CDB, but it's the exact same thing. So if you've heard of DAC before, um, DAC is now CDB or Childhood Disability Benefits on one parent's record. Okay, so we went in, if the child's disability started prior to 22, we want proof of that. Um, we suggest gathering medical history, physician's name, address, phone number, diagnosis history, medications. Um, as far as the physicians are concerned, we want the medical doctors, the PCP, if they see a neurologist, a cardiologist, whatever specialist they're seeing, we want the names, address, and phone numbers of all of those doctors. If they're seeing psychology or psychiatry, um, MDs, right, not um, licensed clinical you know, social worker, okay? They're not taking records from 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 a, a social worker, okay? Um, names, stress, phone numbers, diagnosis history. Don't forget the other diagnoses. So maybe there's some glaring diagnoses that your child has, but then there's some other underlying diagnosis like asthma or other things like that that you might want to include. Anything that affects their overall functioning. They have ADHD, anxiety, depression, any of the any of the the mental health um, challenges that might go along with any of the other diagnoses that you have. Don't forget those. Okay, medications. They want a list of the medications and what they're for. They don't care about the milligrams, but what is the child taking and what is the medication for? Um, you're going to want to have the name, address, and phone number of their um, if the child is working if. Um, um, of any employer that they're working with. If they're in the Texas Workforce Commission Vocational Rehab Program, I would make that clear because they're, you know, that's part of their ticket to work program. The Social Security Administration has a ticket to work program and that's part of that. So, um, and part of the requirement to be in vocational rehab is that the individual has a disability that is an impediment to employment. So if the child is in VR, it's a pretty good indication that the child is uh, disabled because they don't take them if they're not disabled, right? So um, any information on that? The last three months of bank statements, um, be prepared for them to get in the weeds with you on that. Well, what was the the balance on this date? What was the balance on this date? And what's the a, a balance right now? What were the amounts of the deposit in the last four weeks? Um, where did that money come from? I mean, they're just checking everything from work and everything. So let, let's talk about this. 
okay? Because here's a way that you could mess your child up. Um, we're all fans of Cash App and Zelle and um, Venmo and whatever, and sometimes our kids need money, and so we just Zelle them some money or Venmo them some money, and it goes into their account. Well, when you're applying for SSI, uh, and they're seeing all these Venmo or Zelle transfers for mom to kid. They were going to count that as income. So you better be careful with that and how you go about um, how you go about doing that. And, you know, anything like if they're selling, let's say they uh, sell something on Macari or something like that. And then they get money for the sweater that they sold and that went into their account. They're going to count that as well. Um, 1099 income is counted differently than W-2 income, and they will extrapolate it out over over the the 12 the month period. It's not counted um, kind of wholly in, in one given month. I suggest consider chatting with your PCP first and reviewing their records, because remember, we talked about the Social Security Blue Book. This is the medical impairment guide. This is knowledge. Knowledge is power. You already know what the Social Security Administration is going to be looking at for your child to determine if they are disabled. So the conversation goes like this. Doctor, I'm, you know, getting ready to apply for SSI for um, my child, and I've looked at the Social Security Blue Book, and here is what says uh, that we, that the medical records basically have to prove, uh, to prove that he or she is disabled, and they're going to be requesting your records, and I want to know if your records reflect this. I'd like to see a copy. If you got a records request today from the Social Security Administration, what would you send? Review that. Does that depict the picture that the Social Security Blue Book said that they're looking for? If it's not, um, get it fixed. Are there mistakes in the records? So as grownups, um, we like our medical records to be spotless. We don't like anything negative in our medical records, and we try hard for those to, to stay nice, but this is where we need all of the details. So when we're applying for SSI, we don't want the, those records to be spotless or that they have forgot to mention the impediments that are happening as a, happening as a result of, of the individual's disability. We want the record to be clear, um, clear on how it impacts the activities of daily living for that individual. It really, really needs to be clear. Now, you don't have to do this. I always say I'm a little bit extra, but the process is kind of a slow process. And the more that you kind of do your, your front end work, the more likely it's going to be approved on the front end as opposed to requiring an appeal in the future. Bonnie, I'd like to take some questions now. Great. So we have, what is the best way for a grandparent to leave a house to a disabled grandchild upon death? So, and in, in, in typically, um, typically we, you know, again, it could be the special needs trust. I mean, you know, having it in a special needs trust, if the house is paid for, it gets complicated on whether or not the house is paid for, or it isn't paid for and those types of things. But wanting to, uh, a trust is a good way um, to leave a house to make sure that it is for said grandchild and that the, um, that nobody can take away, take it away from them or things like that, that it's set up in such a manner that they couldn't be tricked out of it or any of those other things that could happen. And, and we um, make recommendations. So, so one thing that I will say, when it comes to legal documents and, and, and special needs and special needs planning, we are not fans of LegalZoom. We are not fans of do-it-yourself uh, legal documents. What we see is that people that do that, they make critical mistakes and they end up paying more to get it fixed by an attorney that is really specialized. We make attorney referrals all across the state um, that are nuanced in special needs and um, your average attorney isn't, right? That's not their specialty. So we do recommend that you work with an attorney that is, you know, specifically nuanced in special needs, not your neighbor next door who does real estate or your brother who is a corporate attorney, right? Um, really, I, I think I always just say that your situation is specialized. So it's really, really important that you work with um, specialists. And, and so when it comes to what we do and when it comes to what attorneys do is two different things. And sometimes people are confused on that. We're on the financial side. We're the money. We're nationally certified as social security advisors. We're members of the special needs planning academy. We're planning on how much money needs to go into that special needs trust. We're maximizing benefits for, for state and federally funded programs. We're having money in the right buckets. Okay. 
And the attorneys, I always say they're the paper. So they're where the money and they're the paper. Where the legal documents, you have to have them. Maybe um, maybe guardianship is warranted. Maybe something uh, lesser, like a power of attorney, uh, supported decision-making agreement, things like that. They're going to draft those documents. And the attorneys are also going to draft the special needs trust. Okay. Um, what else do we have, Bonnie? Is there an age requirement for the rent agreement? No. Okay. Well, you have... Uh, a minor child isn't paying rent. I mean, so I would say 18 and up. So, in fairness. Um, suggestions on what to say in the rent agreement, or do you have a template to work off of? We we do have a template for that. You can email um, our office, and we can um, we can send out that template. But it's just a very very um, simple form, and it's just it's just basically saying that my child is paying rent um, to live in our house that's paying for food and shelter and we're charging uh, said child the same amount that we would charge any boarder. So if you had anybody living in your house, this is what I would pay. It's, 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 it's a fairly straightforward um, statement. Anybody can draw that up on a Word document. Got it. Um, did you say call SSA to schedule an in-person appointment, not walk in? Which one? I, I strongly advise against walking in. You will sit there for six to eight hours. It's not a joke. It's serious. <laughs> um, so most people don't have time for that. Um, I am really like a, a, a fan of the online, your statement to apply um, with the online application, because again, it saves the date. It takes you five minutes to do it. it tells you that the Social Security Administration is going to call you to schedule an appointment. They're not calling for the appointment. They're going to call you to schedule the appointment. Okay, so you're going to have advance notice of when the appointment is. Um, and then, uh, you know, operating that way. You can go in and sit down in the office. You'll be there all day. You can schedule an in-person appointment, but those in-person uh, appointments are few and far between. And it may take you a while to actually get one, uh, as, as many as uh, several months. Do personal loans affect my child's SSI? That's a complicated question, and it depends on what the personal loan was used for. I mean, a loan is debt, right? But if a person took a personal loan and then they put that money into their checking account and their money is more than $2,000, then yes, it's going to affect it. I mean, if they count it as income or if the asset's over $2,000. So that's a complicated question. It depends on the origin, but it, quite, it could. It just depends on where the money went. So if a person took a loan, and they took a loan and they never, um, I mean, and that loan was to pay for a car and a hundred percent of that money paid for the car, then that's not going to affect anything adversely. If they took a loan and they put that money in their checking account, that's going to be problematic. Got it. What is my child? What if my child already turned 18 and we already applied for and qualified for his guardianship? Will SSA still look at only my child's income? or will they require the parent's income as well since we are his guardians? So it depends on when you applied, right? So if you applied prior to the child turning 18, you're gonna end up having to reapply because they're gonna look at the parent's income and the child's probably gonna get denied. Um, guardianship is the only form of, um, like they don't recognize the power of attorney. Guardianship is recognized by um, the uh, Social Security Administration. And if you have guardianship, they are gonna want a copy of it. If you have a power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney supported decision-making agreement, they don't want a copy of it and they don't care. In their eyes, it doesn't exist, okay? So um, when we have a child that has a disability that doesn't have the capacity to understand money, maybe they have an IQ below 70, we can apply to be their representative payee. I don't know if I put that in this presentation, so you might wanna write that down. You can apply to be their representative payee and basically says that you're in charge of the money for them, okay? Great, couple more questions. Does the rent agreement have to be notarized? No. Does the rent board charge count as parents' income for tax purposes? Okay, that question comes up every single time. And if you talk to 10 different CPAs, they're gonna tell you 10 different things. In general, you can have a fair share agreement. And what a fair share agreement is, is if the individual is paying their fair share. And what the fair share is, is the mortgage or the rent payment, the utilities and the food for the whole house 
divided by the number of people in the household. So depending on what your monthly expenses are would depend on whether or not you could do a fair share. If it's a fair share agreement, the deal is, is you don't really have to uh, count that as income on your taxes. A lot of times the, um, their, their fair sharing, you know, if it's just two parents and a kid, your kid, and there's only three people to divide the household expenses, their, their fair share would be higher than what SSI might, might, might be. So it doesn't work. Um, we see some families that do, a lot of families do the rent agreement. It's a lot easier. The rent agreement is a lot easier. Some, um, some people will um, claim that on their taxes. Some people won't. And we do recommend that you work with a, a tax professional on that. There are no more questions. Okay, perfect. All right, so you guys can totally ex um, expect that this this process could take six months. If you have a presumptive condition or a, a condition that is um, listed on the compassionate allowance list, it's going to go um, much quicker and they'll start payments um, sooner. After your local office has finalized your application, it's sent to DDS, which is, stands for the Disability Determination Services. It's in Austin, okay? Um, they uh, request and review your loved one's medical records and they're looking for the evidence of disability. DDS can be reached at this 800 number and you can check that they have received the file and find out who it's been assigned to. So if you have gone through your application, you can call the number for DDS and you can say, hey, listen, I'm calling on my, my, my kid, John Smith, and I wanted to know where things stand um, with his SSI application. And they will say, yes, we've received the file. It's waiting to be assigned, which means they're waiting for a caseworker. They're behind right now. So um, I've seen it take as long as six months to get assigned to a caseworker um, lately. Um, hopefully that's not the case for you. Um, if they say no, as a matter of fact, we don't have a file um, on your child, then that means your local office hasn't sent it yet and it's going nowhere. So you need to call back to your local office and find out why your um, child's case has not been sent to DDS. If you need to get a, super inv a supervisor involved, then you're going to want to do this. The other thing that's nice about DDS is once your case is assigned, you're going to get a caseworker, and that caseworker sees this all the way through. And that caseworker will have an extension. You can call and talk to the caseworkers um, specifically and say, hey, listen, uh, what have you received and what are you waiting on? And they say, I've received medical records from XYZ doctor and I'm waiting on medical records from XYZ doctor. Okay, well, when was that request sent to XYZ? Okay, and when is it due back by? When they send a medical records request to the doctor, it has a date that they have to get the records back by. Guess what? Sometimes the doctors don't send the records. And I've seen kids' applications be denied because the doctor simply didn't send the records. So you being involved in this and finding out what they've received and what they've not received, and if you have a doctor on the list that's been sent the request to send the records and he hasn't sent the records, then I would call that doctor myself and say, listen, you guys got this request on such and such a date. And I talked to the Social Security Administration and those records have not been sent and they need to be sent. And here's the fax number that they can be sent to, et cetera. So you want to um, keep this process moving um, because if they get denied because the, the doctor didn't send the record, you got to go through the whole process uh, again. So, um, this is where we were talking about. I'm going to move through quickly um, on this because we have several slides left. But um, the presumptive disability, the compassionate allowance, this is a list of the compassionate allowance. They updated this last list um, back in 2022. They're always updating the list. Um, but you can um, check the list to see if your child or your loved one's diagnosis are on the compassionate allowance uh, list, which means uh, that they can provide up to six months of SSI based off of the disability if the applicant has one of those um, disabilities on the compassionate allowance list. Uh, the determination is going to be ultimately made by the local so social security offices. Um, but the bottom line is, 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 is if there's a likelihood that it's going to be approved and if they're on the compassionate allowance list, there is a likelihood that it's going to be approved, then they will go ahead and um, move forward with that pre-approval. Okay. And it's still going to go through the whole process, um, but it, it, basically they, they fast track it for you. So again, the, li the link on the last um, slide is going to be the compassion allowance list. Anybody can Google that, the compassion allowance list for the Social Security Administration. But, you know, here's some examples. Um, total deafness, no sound, perception in either ear, total blindness, um, 
bed confinement or in, immobility without um, a wheelchair, walker, or crutches due to longstanding condition, excluding a recent accident or surgery, um, stroke, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, intellectual disability, which is usually categorized as an IQ of 70 or below or 75 and below with multiple disabilities. Not everybody knows the, their, their kid's um, IQ, but those are kind of some of the different things. So this is one that comes up a lot. How does working affect SSI? Okay. So SSI is a means-based program for the disabled and for the indigent. Okay, this is not what we're paying into. Remember, this is this is you know um, for for the disabled and for the indigent. But when we work, when the individual works, working affects their check by for SSI, and this is how it works. Um, so let's just say for a, mo a moment that your loved one has gross monthly earnings of twelve hundred dollars. Okay, so right off the bat. Um, there is a general exclusion of $20 and there's a $65 earned income exclusion. So if a person makes $1,200, the individual with a disability is working, the Social Security Administration is not going to count the first $65, okay? So that's going to take our $1,200 down to $1,115 for the month. Then we're going to divide that by two, that comes to 557.50, would be countable as income. So we're gonna take the 914 per month, we're gonna subtract the 557.50, and so that individual would get 356.50 in SSI, okay? So that is how working affects SSI. There is something called a, um, earned income exclusion. So if your loved one is working and they're between the ages of 18 and 22, and they're a full-time student, and a full-time student includes eight hours, not 12, we're programmed to think 12, but it's eight hours for an individual with a disability, you can apply for the earned income exclusion. Again, only 18 to 22, they do have to be a full-time student. And basically what that earned income exclusion will do during those, the, those years is if your child works, it will not count against them. It will not reduce their SSI. So they'll get their full SSI benefit and they will get their, their, um, their earnings as well. So, and there are also um, such things as, um, um, you, other deductions, work-related expenses, and other things like that. So, you know, if it costs money to get them to work, you're using Uber, things like that. There are work-related expenses um, that can also help in, in, in improving those deductions. So I'm going to keep moving. The Social Security Red Book, we talked about the Social Security Blue Book, the Social Security Red Book um, is a book that you need to read if your child is in the Ticket to Work program in vocational rehab, um, summer earn and learn, or pre-employment training services um, through Workforce for Solutions. You're going to want to look at the um, that at that Social Security Red Book on how earnings affect the two different programs. Remember, there's two different programs. There's SSDI and there's SSI, and earnings affect those programs differently, so you need to understand that. Another thing that I want you to know about is if the child is receiving benefits, they are eligible for free benefit counseling, okay? Uh, Imagine Enterprises is one that does a great job on benefit counseling, telling you how much the child can earn, when or how will they lose Medicaid or Medicare, how their benefits would be reduced with work and things like that. So if you're feeling confused on all of that, imagine enterprises, you can schedule an appointment with them for free to do some benefit counseling. And, um, and I do suggest doing that. Again, I'm a proponent of let's get these kids to work. If they can work and earn more than 914 a month, then great. That's what we want for them. Um, and, I want you guys to understand because people think that the Social Security Administration is just here to take everything away. Like you work so hard to get it and they're here to just take it all away. Um, they understand that individuals with disabilities, a lot of them want to work, but a lot of them, um, their mind might tell them that they could work, but physically their body might tell them that they can't. And they understand that people might need to try their hand at things. So there's different phases of work. There's a nine month trial work period. There's a lot of things out there that are really designed to help your child get to work, but not kick them right off, right off of benefits. So just know that. And again, the Social Security Red Book um, is going to talk um, about them. I like to say at the Social Security Administration, um, 
They're not going to tell you about the student earned income exclusion. Some of the stuff you just need to know, you need to educate yourself and you need to ask for uh, maybe one percent of the time have I heard a, a representative say, well, is your child in school or have you applied for the, so, uh, the student earned income exclusion? They don't usually ask that. So you need to ask for it um, to be able to get that um, earned income exclusion that we were talking about. We talked about the Red Book. Um, so one thing that you guys need to know, and this is a big mistake that people make, um, before you apply, make sure that you have child support directed um, appropriately. Um, some states are different than others. In Texas, a lot of times, not all the time, child support will continue post age 18 for an individual with a disability. If that is the case, that is counted income to the child. When you apply for SSI, the way to fix that is that that, um, that child support can be redirected by court order to a first party special needs trust, and then it won't be counted against them for SSI purposes. This is an important thing to have happen. If you're going through a divorce, you need to be mindful of this now, and it's suggested to get it set up on the front end. If um, you've gone through a divorce and child support is going to continue post age 18, um, we have a, a attorney referrals that can help you get this fixed. If you're getting the full amount of SSI and you're getting child support post age 18, uh, it, they are going to catch up with you, and we've seen people where they end up owing the Social Security Administration hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it is critically important. They, it may take them five years to figure it out, but it, um, it's critically important that that child support gets re, redirected, okay? So this is not something that you could do on your own. And one thing that I want to mention here is the attorneys that do the special needs trust and the guardianship and things like that, they're not the ones that do court orders on child support. Support. There's separate attorneys that are nuanced in special needs, but on the different side of the house. So we can make referrals um, on that. These are just some terms to know. I just put that on there because, again, um, the administration likes acronyms and they throw them around. And it's just enough to confuse everybody thoroughly. So we've just got those out there. Um, SSA, Social Security Retirement Benefits, RSDI, Retirement Survivors Disability Income Insurance, um, SSDI, Childhood Disability Benefits, formerly called DAC. And so the Childhood Disability Benefits basically says that the child's disability starts prior to age 22, um, that a child can be covered under a parent's record when a parent becomes disabled or starts drawing Social Security disability. So let's say I'm clipping along, my child's getting 914 a month in SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and then I retire and let's just use this for easy purposes. Let's say my social security benefits monthly, retirement benefits are 4,000 a month. This childhood disability benefits, why it's such an awesome benefit for our kids that haven't worked, is my child will be able to switch over to RSDI, childhood disability benefits under a parent's record. And so instead of getting 914 a month, they're gonna be eligible for 50% of my record. So in that example that I just gave, they're gonna start getting $2,000 a month. And after two years, they're gonna be eligible for Medicare. So that's why the childhood disability benefits are important for our kids that may never ever work um, and, and never pay into that social security disability uh, system. That benefit, once a parent has retired or gone on disability, will continue for the rest of the child's um, life. Once the parent passes away, the benefit will increase from 50% of the parent's amount to 75% of the parent's amount. So um, I think we've got that. Let me, I'm just going to move ahead. This is where kind of we were talking about that. And um, so we've got some details on here on that 50% benefit and the 75%. One thing to be aware of is it's not always clean cut. So if you're getting less, it's, um, it could be because there's family maximums. Some families have more than one child with a disability. Some families have a spouse drawing off of the other spouse's record, and there is a such thing as family ma maximums. So um, we a lot of this stuff, um, you know, we're talking about for Social Security dis benefit, um, disability benefits, you file an application, be found to be medically disabled, you're fully insured, not working or working at the time of the application, but the, app but the earnings are less than 1470 gross um, per month. Uh, those are all things that are going to be important um, when you're looking at these applications. Um, so we want to make sure that you guys have assets in the right buckets, um, making sure that um, there's, there's three places that you can have assets um, that are not counted against, and that's going to be 
um, basically a special needs trust, a third party special needs trust, um, a first party special needs trust, uh, and as well as an ABLE account. Okay, so you can have money in buckets um, that are not counted against them, but the special needs trust is one bucket and an ABLE account is another. Um, and so we want to make sure that when we're leaving money to our kids, that we don't leave money to our kids directly, um, you know, directly to them. Um, for the benefit of John Smith, we want it to leave it to the special needs trust for the benefit of John Smith. So that way, if something happens, the money goes to the special needs trust. It doesn't make John disqualify for Medicaid and SSI or any of those other programs out there. Okay. So ABLE accounts, we have entire presentations. I know we're out of time for today. We have entire presentations on special needs trust, first party and third party, entire presentations on um, ABLE accounts and how to fund them. But the bottom line on the ABLE account, it's achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. You can put up to $17,000 a year into an ABLE account without disqualifying. Um, if the individual with a disability is working, you can have an additional $13,590. The, the money grows tax-free, um, tax tax-free distributions as long as it can be achieved, um, construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. You can pay for it out of an ABLE account. You can pay for food and shelter out of an ABLE account without a one-third reduction to SSI. So, um, for anybody, again, that's attending a podcast and they want the slides, they can, um, they can email us at contact at cpgcares.net and get a copy of the slides. Um, we, you know, we really, um, we have some lists of what a special needs trust can pay for, what an ABLE account can pay for. There are some differences and a lot of times there's confusion on why I should have an ABLE account and a special needs trust. In most cases, people need both. So happy to go over that um, with you guys in, in, in further detail. We have a YouTube channel, Consolidated Planning um, Group YouTube channel. All of our past um, webinars and podcasts live out there. So there's over 200 webinars out there that you can look at and kind of for the, for the step that you're on. Um, and when it comes to comes to planning. We have topics such as waivers and interest lists. We've touched on a lot of things like ABLE accounts and special needs trusts and things like that. Um, people that are thinking about guardianship, we've got uh, full webinars on what you need to think about, what you need to do for guardianship in the state of Texas. So um, having said that, I know that we are really out of time. We're always um, happy to answer any additional questions, one-off questions that people didn't want to ask in the chat box happy to have um, a, a free consultation. You'll hear from um, our, our staff. They'll reach out, find out if you had any questions uh, and if you're interested in moving forward with a personalized consultation, we're happy to do that. I'll, I always say be nice to our staff when they call. Them. Our staff is awesome. Um, but having said that, Bonnie, I will, um, I'll just take any last questions um, before we close. Okay. Um, we have one that says this is the first time they'll be filing their taxes uh, since they didn't file in 2021. Did you say we should have received a 1099 for the SSI? And for their son, they typically uh, file married jointly, but he's 20 years old now. Do we file for him separately? You can. If he lives under his house, under your roof, you can still claim him on your taxes. It just depends. And you should have received a tax document on ssa.gov. You can create a username and password and any tax document should be out there. If you didn't receive it, I received mine. Um, but if you didn't receive it, you should be able to get it on ssa.gov um, for the username and password for your for your loved one. Okay. Um, we put back we put the back pay um, apparently more than two thousand dollars to another trust account. Is that the right way to do to keep a regular account under two thousand dollars? And should we so keep record so of every single expense? Yes. Okay. So it's important to keep record of those expenses. So that's great. Um, and when Social Security gives you back pay. Um, people get scared. They're like, oh my gosh, now I'm going to lose it right away because they gave me more than $2,000. You have nine months to get that money out of the account. Um, good places that you can put that money is into a special needs trust. It would be a first party special needs trust because it's the kid's money, right? That would be a first party special needs trust. There's a Medicaid payback on that. 
you could put the money in an ABLE account. Um, you can't put more than 17,000 in an ABLE account um, a year, but those are good places to put it. But taking that money out of the child's account, putting it in your account is a big no-no and they'll ding you for that. So ABLE account, um, a first party special needs trust. And again, you do have nine months. When you get that back pay and that back pay letter, it says you have nine months to get this moved. Okay, so they're, they're not gonna ding you right away. Can Texas ABLE accounts be used to reduce deductions in SSI payments for a disabled person who is working and receiving income? So people ask basically what they're in, in a nutshell, what the question is, is can I have the income directed to the ABLE account? So that way there won't be an income deduction to the SSI and the answer is no. So the income can go into the kid's checking account and you can turn right around and move that money from the checking account to the ABLE account, but it's still earnings and the earnings deductions would apply unless there's an earned income exclusion because the kid's between 18 and 22 and still in school. And then a phone number or contact for Imagine Counseling. Um, okay, so imagine it's Imagine Enterprises, and I don't have that right off, but I know it's easily searchable. Uh, imagine Enterprises, they do have an 800 number for that benefit counseling, and I highly recommend it. I've definitely done it um, with my kids, and it is very, very, very helpful, especially if you've got a kid that's going to work. If you've got a kid that's never going to work, I don't know that you need the benefit counseling. I mean, there may be some benefits out of it, um, but if you've got a kid that is working, if they're in VR or any of those other workforce programs or anything like that, I definitely recommend benefit counseling. Okay, great. That is all of our questions. Thank you all so much for joining us, and thank you again, Allison. Certainly a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. You guys um, have been great. You ask great questions, and we're here to help. So if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks so much. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.